So I'm interested in this, uh, I believe it's called the Oak Street Cooperative, uh, real estate investment co-op that you, uh, I believe, helped co-found there in uh, Burlington. Could you just uh, kind of give me the rundown on what the basic structure of that uh, organization is and uh, what, what projects you have going on with it? Yeah, yeah. So um, this kind of emerged, this idea of trying to get a real estate co-op going in Vermont emerged out of kind of a few different, there were a few different threads that came together. Um, so we were definitely aware of the, um, the real estate co-op project in Minneapolis and some of the talk about creating one in New York City, although I've yet to see any sort of like, you know, movement beyond kind of planning on that front. But sort of we've been aware of, aware of the model for a few years. Um, and we have a co-op investment club in town um, or, you know, where there's a bunch of us who all own little chunks of an LLC and put between 20 and 200 bucks a month into it and then vote on where in the co-op economy to invest the money. Um, so there's kind of like some discussions within that club for a few years about, yeah, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool to eventually have a real estate co-op in town, like if an opportunity arises. Um, and so we kind of got started to get serious about it maybe a year and a half ago. Um, and kind of uh, initially kind of actually not, not looking at the, the building that the Oak Street Co-op bought recently, but another building um, that would be uh, the, that the, this kind of like co-op brewery startup was thinking about as a location. And so we discussed, okay, well, if we want to, you know, with this co-op, with this other co-op startup, there'd been this whole long period of like, oh, maybe we could do that, but we would need to raise, raise the money in order to sign the lease. But like, they want the lease signed in a month and we'd, yeah, there's sort of, we were kind of caught in this chicken and an egg situation for a long time, financing and space-wise. Um, and so this, this space kind of emerged with kind of a patient selling owner who kind of somewhat complex reasons why it was kind of a, it was for sale, but, he, but not really like broadly for sale, but he liked the idea that, oh, this sounds good. I'll sell you this commercial condo type thing. Um, so we discussed within that group, does it make sense for the, for the, startup co-op to buy it directly or should we form some other entity to hold the real estate and, and ultimately decided on this real estate co-op as, as the, the way to do it. Um, and so the, and so the reasons why we decided that were a few fold, but um, essentially the core idea is we created a consumer cooperative um, that essentially functions as a real estate holding company that both community members and tenants can become members of. Um, and under, Vermont, under Vermont's kind of securities law, the common shares of consumer cooperative are um, kind of have a self-executing exemption. You don't need to go through any sort of off offering um, bureaucracy in order to sell those shares to people, right? Our food co-op can sell a share of the food co-op to someone at the, at the cash register. Um, and those shares are allowed to pay up to a 6% dividend. And so then it was like, okay, so if we can essentially raise a down payment from these kind of community investors who would receive, you know, a capped, capped return on capital. And then any additional profit goes to the tenants prorated by how much rent they pay in classic kind of consumer cooperative fashion. Um, that could be a way to, you know, with relatively low overhead form a new kind of new entity, you know, raise the, raise the sort of the down payment money um, and then buy it, buy the space. Um, and so we're still actually working on that project. Um, we actually just got approved for the mortgage for that one, but um, it, things kind of got put on hold for, for a while because of COVID. Um, but in the meantime, as we sort of developed this model and got the bylaws worked out and all of, all, all of that stuff, um, this other uh, opportunity popped up. And so a subgroup, there's a debate kind of discussion within the initial founding group of this Vermont real estate cooperative um, and ultimately decided to keep the project separate. So we formed a second consumer co-op corporation to buy this, this building that's, that, that is the Oak Street Cooperative now, which essentially was there's a small kind of like, you know, maybe I think five or seven total locations, um, a restaurant chain in town called the, the Skinny Pancake, which sells crepes. Um, and they built this, this kind of mixed use building and, and out um, they, uh, as a commissary kitchen for all of their restaurants, but then they'd outgrown that. Um, and so the, the founder was interested in selling it, but, but in a way that would keep it kind of the infrastructure in use for local food system stuff versus it just being sold, gutted and turned into condos or apartments. Um, 
and there there is a, a three bedroom apartment upstairs in the building because it's you know in a you know urban residential na- neighborhood. Um, so there were a couple of businesses, small small business startups um, that were interested in going in the downstairs space. Um, and so, so basically it was a woman who makes Dominican food and had been doing kind of pop-ups and catering, but had been on the lookout for a permanent location. Sisters were interested in doing kind of bre- a breakfast and lunch um, thing. Um, and so they became kind of the, the core anchor tenants. Um, and then also subletted to, to some folks who, were, who do um, uh, produce tortillas um, who wanted to split up their manufacturing so that the corn tortillas and flour tortillas were created in two separate facilities so that they could be certified gluten-free for the corn tortillas. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we did, so we, we decided, okay, let's, let's do this. Um, the, we, we formed the new cooperative like at the new year, basically with, with, a, with um, two of the business owners and um, kind of three of the community supporters who had come out the other thing as this, as this founding board of directors and the first members. Um, and then we did kind of a public facing campaign um, to raise you know, minimum thousand dollar investments from, from other Vermont residents. Um, and we got about 70 some uh, folks to put at least a thousand dollars in, um, which covered the down payment and then got a, a mortgage from, from a local credit union that was on very favorable terms because um, they're uh, they're fairly supportive of our co-op stuff. Um, so it's like, you know, for a commercial mortgage, it was 30 year amortization um, with balloon payment at 15 uh, with like the first six months interest only and 3.75% interest, which was pretty darn good for a, for a commercial mortgage. Um, so after a slight a few months of delay because of COVID, so we were supposed to close at the end of March, um, but ended up closing towards the end of June. Um, the, you know, the restaurants did some build out. we started to do, um, to, to invest in the building in little bits and pieces here. Um, we just actually approved, there's a kind of weatherization program that will pay for rent, for rental properties. They'll pay 75% of the weatherization cost if the landlord puts the other 25%. So we just, just approved that to get some new windows and insulation and you know, are thinking about solarizing and ne- in the next year and some other things along those lines. Um, and so, so it's, so the Oak Street Co-op is really feeling like a good, so there's some good lessons learned about both how we fundraised and kind of like getting the, you know, getting, getting all the systems in place. And so now hopefully we'll be closing on the, um, this commercial condo thing in the next couple of months. Um, and there's energy within the group to be looking at multifamily apartment buildings as this kind of next step um, to, to sort of move forward and kind of have housing be a big, bigger piece of the puzzle with the Vermont Real Estate Co-op owning ultimately multiple properties. So nice. that's the that's the quick, <clears throat> quick overview of the, the story. <laughs> Very cool. And uh, how many <clears throat> how many members does the uh, Oak Street Co-op have currently? I think we're somewhere in the neighborhood of like 75 to 80 at okay. this point. And are you, is the goal to kind of grow that indefinitely? I mean, as many members as you can get, or do you have, have you put any limit on that? Um, we've sort of put a soft cap. We had a few, we've had a few people, additional people after the campaign be like, I'd like to invest. And we're like, eh, yeah, okay. I think our cash reserves could afford to be a little, a little chunkier. Um, so, okay, we'll bring in say with like another up to $10,000 extra. Um, one of the other things though is, um, is that for the next few years, uh, we, we also did use, uh, because we, voting members, uh, because of the way the securities law exemptions work, had to be in state. Um, but we did do sort of a de minimis offering of a, uh, to a few kind of like uh, family members of board members and some of the business owners to do um, some preferred shares. And so in the short term, we're going to be continuing to allow people to invest so that we can retire the preferred shares with member shares. Um, and so, so that's kind of, I think, and once we've done that, then, then I think the question will be, um, well, there's a few strategic questions. You know, one will be, you know, do we, is the Oak Street thing kind of something where we want to keep, sort of, is that going to be a vehicle where we want to keep sort of expanding and, you know, and deepening the amount of capital we have? Or are we going to sort of gradually be buying, buying back the, the member shares as people want them bought back so that more profits available to be returned to, to the tenants? Um, 
and then, or another question is, and we did set up the bylaws that this would be possible if say the Vermont real estate co-op, which was operating in parallel now has like four or five properties and, you know, there's economies of scale to be had. Does it make sense for us to sort of merge the two co-ops into one? Right. Um, so, so there's, I think a number of strategic questions along those lines over the next few years, but we're kind of like, you know, not active, not continuing to actively recruit capital for the, for the Oak Street co-op for the moment. You know, unless you know, maybe in the in the new year, if we're like, okay, we're, we need eighty thousand dollars to cover the solarization of the building, maybe we would raise some some more money on that front or something like that. Great. Um, so it did sound like you had uh, some at least tentative future plans to expand into a, a residential owning a residential unit as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Um, and that would yeah. also be through the Oak Street Cooperative. Um, well, so the Oak Street Co-op has one residential unit upstairs. So okay. the, the building yeah, is a mixed use building. So we have one, one apartment, uh, three bedroom apartment in the, in the upstairs area. But the Oak Street Co-op itself, is, you know, that, that one is not sort of, we're not having conversations right now about expanding. It's more kind of in consolidating mode. It's the, the Vermont Real Estate Co-op is the, is the one that kind of is more holding okay. the vision of holding, ultimately owning multiple units really trying to start to scale and in the the vermont real estate investment co-op how many how many people are involved with that i think that has 28 members at this point and we're kind of on the cusp of starting this is basically there's a founding group where we started off saying all right let's each put in a thousand dollars um and then when the time comes to sort of like move move on the um for on the sort of first deal then you know we'll invite invite folks to put in more. So we're sort of in that process right now in terms of bringing in a few few additional new members, plus we brought in some some additional capital from existing members and that sort of thing to you know get to the get to the down payment for the space we're looking at. And um, so when you were doing fundraising for this uh, and, 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 and talking to people about for, for both projects, the Oak Street and the Vermont uh, Cooperative. Um, how did you approach people? I mean, what was your pitch and, and who did you go after specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's been a little bit, a little bit different between the two. Um, with the Oak Street co-op thing, um, you know, we did this kind of this public facing campaign on a local kind of equity crowdfunding website called Milk Money. Um, so there are some folks who kind of came in through their network where we put together kind of a camp informational document uh, that, you know, again, we, we didn't need to go through all of the, officially all of the offering stuff, but we, we still put together kind of a nice document that was like, here's our financial projections and here's sort of the vision and here's where it came from and here's information about the businesses will be the tenants and all of that, right? So we kind of put together a nice little thing to, to sort of be able to give to people as to, who are considering investing. Um, and so then, you know, there's kind of a core of the co-op movement people, you know, in town who put in some money. Um, but I think for, for that one, it was actually really sort of like the success was driven by, you know, the, the, the businesses that wanted to be in there, um, you know, had pretty enthusiastic followings kind of from what they've, they've done in terms of pop-ups and, and other things like that. Um, so they were, they were kind of willing to lend some of that, you know, that kind of community uh, reputational capital, so to speak, to, to the campaign and bring in and sort of to say to their supporters, like, hey, if you want to be able to get empanadas and, you know, and, and other things from, from us when we, when we open, uh, you know, help us, help us get into a, a place that will be, you know, have kind of like an equitable rental agreement and all of that. Um, so, so I think a lot of that, and then we did a little, you know, open house type thing where they made, they made kind of finger food snacks and did walkthroughs and, and, and things like that. So, so really, so, so I think for that one, it was a mixture of people who are in, interested in support of the businesses, uh, people who, there's some folks who lived in the neighborhood for whom they went to the old kind of chubby muffin cafe to get a cup of coffee and a breakfast sandwich somewhat regularly and wanted to, you know, had some stake in, that continuing to have it, that role as a community oriented cafe um, as a piece of it, you know, some, and then some folks are just interested in local investment and or co-ops. So kind of a coalition of folks. Whereas so far the Vermont Real Estate Co-op, we haven't done the public campaign piece so much yet. It's been much more leaning on the sort of, you know, existing network of co-op, you know, co the co-op crew plus people they know sort of individually. 
Um, you know, my sense is we're probably going to, you know, I think once we get, have the first building in place, then, um, then potentially like when we're, when we're, when we're thinking about, okay, multi-unit apartment building is the next thing we go after, um, doing sort of more of a like, all right, public campaign for the second, second, uh, second property type thing. But I think for the first one, we've been somewhat purposefully kind of keeping it, you know, not trying to sort of overstretch in terms of, um, in terms of what we're doing before we have the first thing in place. So if uh, somebody uh, listening to this or reading this uh, has a, a, a group of uh, friends, companions in their area and they're interested in doing something like this, what would you say from your experience so far would be, uh, you know, the first things to start with? You're interested in starting some kind of real estate investment cooperative. Yeah, so I think the, the first thing is just making sure that you, you have a decent grasp of what the, the, bound, the boundaries are on sort of the exemptions for securities exemptions for, for um, cooperatives in your state. Because like in many ways, what we ended up putting together was very much informed by the nuances of like how the Vermont law worked in terms of what percentage of the total number of shares people can own and how much is the maximum capped return and, you know, and some of these other, other things and an understanding that like, okay, we, as long as we're not crossing state lines, we can just sell these shares without having to file anything with this, with the state. But, you know, the U S is just a patchwork of different laws. So, um, so doing a little bit of research on that front, it feels like the, the kind of real first step. Um, you know, and there is something to be said about, you know, forming something, having people put, put their skin in the game and then they just putting it in a, you know, credit union money market account or, you know, depositing it with shared capital cooperative or something like that. And as a like meantime, just to be like, all right, everyone's kind of at the table and there's some money in the pot. But really, I, I feel like it, it, it's something that kind of floated as a good idea for probably two years. And then when like an actual opportunity arose that we were able to then get concrete and say, okay, let's do the financial projections. Let's build a budget. Let's do all those, those things because this is actually real. That you know, I think that that really became the catalyst to say, all right, let's actually move on this versus like dream about having a, you know, a cooperative landlord essentially, right? Um, and so, so I, th I think that's, it's that kind of keeping an eye out and building sort of a community of, um, kind of a, a community of folks around, around this idea. And certainly having the sort of like co-op investment club was, was gave it sort of an, you know, there's some, something that was lower overhead, lower kind of stakes that, that a core group had like learned to work together on that, that this kind of in some ways felt like, okay, we'll do it, do, do something that's like an order of magnitude bigger than, you know, making $5,000 investments in different little um, co-op projects over the past few years. Um, great. Yeah. And uh, so you mentioned for the Oak Street Cooperative that there are both uh, the businesses, the or the business owners, anyway, renting uh, the spaces. There are are themselves members of the cooperative, correct? And then there are community uh, members who are also members. Are they are there different types of member shares? Do you, uh, or does in this case, they're all one class, right? So it's all just okay. kind of consumer co-op member shares. And so the folks who are um, for kind of non-tenants, right? Essentially, they, you know, they don't qualify for patronage refunds because they're not paying anything in, in. But they could get, but they they will qualify. Basically, we said, all right, it's a first first slice of profit goes as a dividend on each share, so it's a dividend on capital, and then any additional profit above that then goes back to tenants as patronage. Okay, so there's kind of. Uh two two flows for the surplus of the co-op then i guess mm -hmm. to the to the share payments which are different than than patronage which is just going to the tenants right right, right. return on capital and then return on use right okay great mm -hmm. um steve and so that, that was part of it where where like if we had if we had under vermont law if we had done okay preferred shares for that for that sort of investment beyond the kind of little de minimis offering we did to a few folks who already were known and all of that. Like that would have required us to go through a more elaborate securities filing process that would have taken some 
some mo additional money and horsepower versus just having those member shares be something that can also deliver the kind of investment return as well. Uh -huh. um, and Steve, do you have any, any further questions? I can't think of anything else to ask. Um, as long as we've got you, would you talk a little more, Matt, about the, um, the, in, the investment club and how that operates? Yeah, yeah. So there was, again, and lots of Minneapolis uh, inspirations, but <laughs> modeled after a, a club called Co-op Principle that, um, that was founded in Minneapolis, I don't know, uh, probably close, close to 10 years ago now, maybe, something like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of keeps, keeps slipping, right? Um, but essentially, there's a, a exemption in sort of investment company law that says if you have an organization that's like a partnership, it has to be like a pass-through entity, so either a simple partnership or a um, or a LLC partnership, where no one's being paid to make investment decisions, but the members are all kind of participating equally in that. Um, and then, and no one owns more than twenty-five percent of the total assets of the club. Um, then that club is like that organization doesn't have to register as a securities company, it's understood to be an investment club. Um, so then kind of taking that model and saying, all right, so there's a bunch of us, we created the Vermont Solidarity Investing Club where, you know, we formed the LLC, we had, you know, maybe, um, we probably had something like 15 or so founding members um, who all then committed to say, all right, then we'll do an ACH draw every month that, you know, you know, between $20 and $200 a month is kind of the range at which you can select how much you want to go into the club and then everyone owns, you know, a prorated portion. And then we have, you know, we meet synchronously about every quarter and then use Lumio for, for making decisions otherwise around investments. So it's like every month we have about $1,500 goes into a pot. And then every few months we have a vote on how do we want to divvy that money up? Like how much do we want to put in Cooperative Fund of New England versus how much do we want to you know, put into, you know, a co-op locally that's doing an offering or, and things like that. And so at this point, we have about 25 or 26 members of the club um, and about 50,000 in assets. Nice. Cool. Um, okay, last question. So you've talked about four separate things on this call. Whoops, hold on, my screen's one blank. There we go. Uh, you've talked about the EOC, the Loan Club, the Oak Street Co-op, and the Vermont Real Estate Investing Investment Co-op. Yeah, Vermont um, Vermont Real Estate Co-op. Yeah, Real Estate Co-op. Okay, okay. Um, so I take it that all these things are standalone entities with no legal overlap, mm -hmm. right? Uh, is there how much overlap is there in the actual like participating members? Yeah. So. Um... There's, there's definitely, yeah, there's, it's, it's literally a Venn diagram of lots of. <laughs> That's kind of what I assumed. <laughs> for instance, with like VEOC, you know, Elias Gardner, who works at the New School of Montpelier, which is a worker co-op, is like, is on the board of the VEOC and is also the secretary of the, um, of the investment club, um, you know, and I think is invested in at least one, if not two of the real estate co-ops, right? So there's definitely like, you know, the, in some ways, the origin of our, our, investment club was that there's a group for years that was kind of a, you know, aiming to create a cooperative Vermont, like cross-sector co-op network. And ultimately what we ran into was the realization after several years of meetings um, was that like most of the um, horsepower, so to speak, was being, or uh, was being generated at the sector level, right? So the, the, you know, the needs of the credit unions are mostly being met by the credit union association and the food co-ops by the neighboring food co-ops association and other things like that. So there was like not, it didn't feel like ultimately there was enough, uh, enough essentially to do for the cross sector statewide um, formal organization. Mm -hmm. um, so we more or less, other than like occasional social events and doing a little bit of stuff during employee ownership month, we more or less kind of like put the the vision of a membership organization for organizations on pause. Um, and then the, the investment club kind of became the pivot that the, the individuals who were putting energy into that um, said, okay, well, let's create something that's an organization of individuals who are advancing this sort of thing. Um, and at the same time, you know, have it be something where, okay, so it's not just, not just about chatting, but we're all putting some, putting some, some resources 
kind of consistent way into into a pot, right? And saying, all right, so this this what we're doing, even if it's you know a relatively token amount, um, is we're we're putting our personal resources towards advancing the the cooperative economy. Um, and so, so so in some ways, the investment club has kind of become the informal, kind of informally the kind of one of the core social networks of the co-op movement in Vermont in terms of people who are kind of like have the personal level of kind of movement commitment versus just career level of commitment. Mm -hmm. um, and so then it off, you know, so then there's a lot of overlap between it and other key institutions and organizations and initiatives that, that happen here. Interesting. Interesting. So um, I'm just going to guess here that the investment club is, includes a lot of people who are uh, supporters of co-ops, but maybe themselves not in a co-op, or at least you know beyond, let's say, being in a in a credit union or a um, you know a, a consumer co-op. People who want to be more involved, but otherwise wouldn't have a vehicle to do so. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say that's probably like half the membership, and then the other half is people who are kind of more actively engaged in in co-op stuff, either through development stuff like like I do, or you know working for worker co-ops, um, that sort of thing. Um, so like, you know, I mentioned Elias, who's, you know, a worker owner at the New School of Montpelier, you know, one our founding founding treasurer um, had, was working at a credit union at the time and now works for like a, a worker co-op. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of a mix there. Very cool.